the recording for the last lecture. I've got it. I'm having some technical issues with Zoom and uh, getting that moved over to YouTube. And so I'm working with IT right now. So I'm aware of the problem um, and hopefully we will get that fixed and those things posted soon um, for you guys. So bear with me while we kind of work our way through some of that unpleasantness associated with technology. Okay. So we last left off, we're talking about the properties of water. And so um, we left off with some of the, uh, you know, California geography lesson that I inflicted on you guys. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, but it kind of is a good state really for ecology because there's a lot of ecosystems in California. There's actually a lot more than people realize because of oceans and mountains, but there's deserts and rainforests and plains and all sorts of stuff in California. Why might make it a good state to sort of take a look at. It's habitat, right? So that's what those two energetics ones, if you're wondering where the biological impact is of those two, why we care about heat capacity and heat of vaporization is because it gives us biological impact. It gives us, in one case, habitats for organisms to live in and thrive in and grow in. And the more habitat you have, the more options you have, the more likely it is that you're gonna find a place to succeed and reproduce. And that's the reason for those. Now let's go ahead and take a look at another property of water, the solvent properties of water. So water basically will dissolve a lot of different things. As a matter of fact, we have what's called a solution. And basically when you take a look at an, a solution, a solution generally has two parts to it. One is it has the solvent, which basically does the dissolving. And then it has the, what's called the solute, which is the stuff that gets dissolved. Now water typically will dissolve a lot of solutes. And generally speaking, what it does is it will dissolve polar and charged molecules. Now in chemistry, when you talk about solubility, there's a mantra they use in chemistry that basically says like dissolves like. So for instance, if water is polar, which it is, then it will dissolve other things like it, like polar molecules, like salts and sugars and different types of things that are also polar. It also has a little bit more play to that than most because it can also dissolve charged things because actually polarity is based on charge. It means you have a positive charge and a negative charge right, a positive side and a negative side. And so with water, you have the same thing, right? So you have these kind of positive-ish looking hydrogen tails with this little negative-ish looking oxygen. And so what will happen is if you're a positive ion, like sodium, for instance, what will happen is water will take its negative oxygens and surround the sodium, positive on negative. And basically once water surrounds you, you've been dissolved, right? It's called, what's called a hydration shell in a bio. On the flip side of it, if you're negatively charged, the positive tails of water will surround you to form another hydration shell and that'll dissolve that. So this is salt. This is basically how salt dissolves in water. So when you put salt in food, the reason why you can taste salt is because what you're tasting is the ions. Okay? Your taste buds have receptors for the sodium ion and for the chloride ion. And that's what you're tasting. And so when you put it on the food, what happens is the water in your food will dissolve the ions and then you'll taste that salty taste in the food itself. What about if it's not dissolved? Like what if you have something that doesn't have water in it? Or a lot of times students will ask me, so what does salt taste like if it's not dissolved? Well, here's the problem. We will never know because we will never actually be able to taste salt because as soon as it touches our tongue, our saliva dissolves the salt into ions. So all we know and all we will ever know is what salt tastes like when it's in its dissolved state. We'll never actually know what it tastes like as an undissolved crystal. 
because we can't get access to that. My guess, by the venture, it would probably taste like nothing, is my guess, right? Because it's the ions we're tasting. So that kind of leads us also to kind of another um, type of an idea when we take a look at the solvent properties of water. <clears throat> Remember we said like dissolves like, and water is polar. And so what that basically means is it creates an entire segment of molecules that are like water. We call those hydrophilics. So a hydrophilic water molecule, basically hydro means water, philic uh, means love. So philic is actually the root for a Greek word phileo, which is one of the many Greek words for love. It usually is referring to like friendship or sibling love, like love of a family or a friend or something of that nature. But these are water lovers. And so pretty much anything like water will be in this group. The polars and the charged molecules will be in this hydrophilic group. Now, what about those things that are not like water, right? So this also creates the other guys, if you will, right? There's hydrophilics and then the other ones. The other ones are the hydrophobics. And so this basically means water fears, right? So this is the water fearing molecule. Typically speaking, they tend to be nonpolar uh, in nature. And so um, these oftentimes these nonpolar molecules will have nonpolar bonds in them, where it basically means those electrons are going to be shared equally between two atoms. Uh, so it's kind of like a stalemate in tug of war. Um, one of the things that atoms have is an intrinsic property in them um, that is, is like a magnetism or like an attraction toward electrons. Right. So some atoms are very strong attractors of electrons and some are not so much. In the in chemistry, we act it's a it's a it's a term that's referred to as electronegativity. That's what the term is for it. And electronegativity is a periodic physical property of an atom that when you take a look at the periodic table, you can actually predict it. So this electronegativity or subtraction to electrons will increase as you go up the periodic table and to the right. So when you take a look at, say, for instance, a bond like in water, right? A hydrogen oxygen bond, that would be uh, two atoms that has an electronegativity that is in oxygen much greater than in hydrogen. Why? Because oxygen is way over here to the right and it's on, on the upper region. So it means it has a very strong attraction toward electrons and whereas hydrogen, not so much. And so if you take a look, for instance, at um, two oxygens, that's a good example of a nonpolar one. So you have two oxygens which are sharing electrons, but because they're the same, they have the same attractiveness for electrons, that electron cloud is gonna be equally distributed at stalemate style between those two atoms. Nobody's gonna be a winner. So nobody's gonna have this sort of lopsidedness. They're not going to have a negative side and a positive side. Whereas on the oxygen hydrogen one, you can see that the oxygen is gonna take all the electrons and you're gonna have this sort of what, like kind of the lopsided washing machine effect, right? So all of the clothes are going to be on one side. All the electrons are going to be one side, making oxygen negative. That's a polar bond. And that's what makes water a polar molecule. So a good example of some of the hydrophobics are things like the oils. Oils, greases, waxes, things like that. It's a group called the lipids. We'll talk about that later on in this chapter. Um, one of the things to understand is that these two groups, the hydrophilics and the hydrophobics, They hate each other. If you're into Shakespeare, it's like the Montagues and the Capulets, right? If you're into history, hillbilly history, I guess, the Hatfields and the McCoys, right? But it's worse than that. These molecules are incredibly tense. They don't just not prefer each other. They absolutely hate each other. Like the hydrophobics, basically are looking to imagine and create a universe where none of the hydrophilics, including water, the kingpin of the hydrophilics, right? Where none of these hydrophilic molecules exist. So they're not just willing to sort of let bygones be bygones. They want to aggressively and angrily and hatefully eradicate the universe of all hydrophilics. They can't stand them. If you've ever been near somebody that you can't stand, 
you've forced to deal with them, some information related to them, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, you, you kind of feel that sense of fire, right? It's like you're, I mean, you're just like your teeth are gritting. I mean, you're just basically sawing off enamel, right? You're just clenching down. So, I mean, it feels like you're just about ready to spontaneously combust. You are just like just so overwhelmed with like anger and in this case, hatred, right? And that's what these two molecules are like. So they're not just like, oh, well, I just don't like you. It's like, no, if I get a chance, I'm going to cut you at the throat and I will bathe in your blood and I will rejoice in your death. That's pretty extreme, yes? So that gives you an idea of how much these molecules hate each other. It's not just a passive thing. It's a very aggressive, dark, malevolent hatred. They just want to fly apart from each other. And so that's important. So we'll pick that up a little bit later toward the end because that's an important dynamic, especially when we start building biological structure later on. So keep that in mind, put a little star on that one in your head, and then we'll pick that one up later. So another <clears throat> property of water is basically given to us by the structure of water. It's cohesion which basically is the attraction of water molecules to each other. So a desire for water to cling to itself, that's cohesion, okay? It's foiled by another one, which is adhesion. So this is basic, um, typically the attraction of water To hard surfaces, like glass, for instance. Like uh, one of the examples that I like to use for cohesion and adhesion, I'm just going to give you like a really quick kind of a, a non-biological example, and then I'm going to give you a biological example of why we care. So I'm going to take a windshield, so these are, and in one of them I'm going to treat it with rain -X, and the other one I'm going to not treat it with rain -X. Anybody know what rain -X is? It's a brand name, actually. Don't really need it a whole lot in Colorado. In some areas, like when it gets really bad, uh, like in Tornado Alley, where you get some pretty nasty storms, you'll see rain -X popping up. It's a coating. Basically, uh, we use a lot of de-icers, um, but rain -X is more of like a uh, a coating that you put on your windshield and it just beads the water off. So when it rains, um, it kind of takes a little bit of pressure off your windshield wiper blades. And so um, that why I say it's usually like in, in more rainy areas, it's like, cause in like uh, when in Kansas, we have rain X, a lot of it, right? Because the storm rainstorm would be so heavy that your wiper blades couldn't go fast enough to keep your windows clear. So you would have to have rain X to allow that water to sort of sheet off so it gives you a fighting chance of being able to get home alive, right? So that's kind of what they're used for. But when you take a look at rain -X, what happens is you have a drop of rain coming in, right? Now, if you take a look at the raindrop itself, oh, if you take a look at the raindrop itself, so the raindrop is held together by cohesion. Matter of fact, has anybody ever seen videos of astronauts playing around with water in space? Right, they got that little little drop of water and it's kind of hanging out there. But it's a perfect sphere, isn't it? And that's basically the water molecules basically grabbing onto each other with these hydrogen bonds, zippering themselves up. And they, that's cohesion. They like each other, they hang on to each other. Now, when you get into our atmosphere, you have the same thing. A drop of water held together by cohesion. But the reason why it looks like a raindrop or a drop is because the gravitational field pulls on the drop and elongates it. And that's the reason why a raindrop is elongated, is because the pull of gravity on that otherwise creates a ball of water. Okay. And so that's kind of what's happening. So this comes down, and then we're going to start off with the untreated windshield. So when this raindrop hits the windshield, what happens? What happens to that drop as soon as it's going to? Yeah, it sticks to the glass, right? 
That's why you have windshield wipers. Because what's going to happen is as soon as it hits the glass, it basically spreads out. And that's because of adhesion. So the water, instead of sticking to itself, is now attracted to the glass and starts to stick to the glass. Until we get a little film of water on our windshield. Now, when you treat it with Rain-X, what's going to happen? As soon as it hits your windshield, it basically beads up and it rolls right off. PowerPoint crash or Zoom crash? Somebody's crash. Can't get through a section without that, right? So basically, it's going to beat up unexpectedly. Of course, it's unexpected. And then it rolls right off. So basically at this point, what happens is cohesion is stronger than adhesion. And the untreated one, adhesion is stronger than cohesion because it's pulling the water molecules apart from each other and smearing them, smearing them up against the glass. Okay. So that's basically how you wet stuff. By the way, uh, from a biological perspective, the same thing's happening on the earth, right? The raindrops splatter onto the ground and get absorbed into the ground partly because of adhesion. It adheres to the soil. Um, we've all kind of seen when rain just sort of beads off, right? Have you ever kind of like put water on a really, really super dry surface and it doesn't actually get in there, doesn't ever make contact, just kind of like rolls right off of the, the surface. So we can actually see combinations of adhesion, cohesion in nature as well. But one of the biological applications of cohesion and adhesion is this. So what is this? For 100 points, what is this? <laughs> like, <laughs> right, it's a tree, but not any tree. It's like one of those redwoods in California, those big things you can drive a car through. Have you ever wondered how a tree is managing to get water in it from its roots all the way up to the crown, which is some 200 feet above the ground? How does it do it? With adhesion. Because the vascular tissue inside a tree acts like blood vessels. The walls of your blood vessels are adhesive. It's like the walls of glass. And so the water sticks to it. And when it sticks to it, then what happens is it pulls the other water molecules it's still stuck to, right? Because I don't let go of you guys. What happens is I pull on you guys. So if I'm like a water molecule and I stick up against the glass, I'm still connected to you guys. So when I smear it up against the glass, I'm pulling on you guys. So you guys are going up. So that's because of this adhesive surface. When you take a look at the vascular tissue in a tree, it's the same thing. There are long tubes that basically act like straws. And what happens is the water smears against the wall of the tube adhesively, and it pulls the column up through the tree through adhesion. Okay, so that's actually how plants get water up to the crown of itself. So the next trait of water. Um, first of all, the solid is less dense than the liquid. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to lay down a shattering, an absolute mind-numbing fact. It's going to just blow your mind out of the water. You ready for it? Ice floats. Are you guys blown away? Most of you guys are looking at me like, like, like this. Are you impressed? Some of you guys may actually be illustrating the flotation ability of ice in some of your drinks, perhaps, right? Is that really amazing to you? If I put some ice in your drink 
and it's loading? I mean, are you just like mesmerized? You're like, yeah, you know the answer to that. We're looking at you like you're just absolutely nuts, right? But this is heretical. This is the only thing in nature that does this. You know why? Because when you basically go back and forth through your states, right? You have three main states. Sorry about that. So you have three main states of matter. You have a gas, you have a liquid, and you have a solid. In a gas, your molecules are far apart. Not unlike you guys, if I were to spread you guys across the entire campus. Chances of you ever meeting, pretty slim because you're spread out over vast distances. As a result, I can say that the density of my class is very low. That means that there are very few numbers of you per unit space. In many cases, if I take a particular amount of space on the campus, that number will be exactly zero. None of my students in this space. None in this space over here, none in this space. Oh, hey, here's one, right? But it's a low density. It's a very low number of individuals per unit space. Now, what happens if, with the substance when I cool it down? So when I cool it down, what happens is the atoms start to come together. And as they come together, they form a tighter group. That's a liquid. That's like taking you guys who are normally scattered across the campus and having you guys all settle in here in 1117. I can argue now that there is a greater density. Right? There are more students per unit space because you are closer together. I cooled you down. Now here's what every other substance does. Let's keep cooling. As you continue to cool together, what happens with most substances is you start to pack together very, very tightly. So this is basically the highest density. This is like if I were to take all of you guys in this room and have you guys all sit in one table, right? Snuggle in, shoulder to shoulder, right? Get cozy. That would be a high density, right? So in that area, there's gonna be a high density of you guys per unit space, because there's a lot of you in a very small area. That makes you solid. That's what every other substance does. Metals do this. Um, everything does this. It gets denser and denser and denser until you become a packed solid. Except for water. Water doesn't do that. So what does water do? So once it becomes a solid, which is freezing, instead of getting denser, what it does, it expands. Nothing does that except for water. Because of this expansion, it causes it to become less dense. And one substance that is less dense and another substance that is more dense, the less dense thing will float. This is the reason why a pencil floats in water because a pencil, the wood, has less density than the water, so it floats. Anything in water that's less dense than water will float. And so that's basically what happens. So here's what it looks like. So basically we have our gas. Um, oops. Where'd it go? There we go. There we go. So basically up here, we have above 100, we have the gas situation, right? So that's kind of like, this area up here. So everything's far, far apart and very less dense. So it's very little density. This is one of the reasons why gases rise 
right? Is because of that low density. Um, then as you cool off, you're gonna become liquid. So you can see how all the molecules of water are kind of coming together. And then what happens is at about four degrees to about zero degrees, this is all water, but what you get is the densest water possible. So what happens is as those water molecules start to come together and come together, right? You hit four degrees and they start to pack together and pack together and pack together so they get denser and denser and denser. You're approaching zero degrees. And so cold water that's between zero and four degrees, that's refrigerator temperature, is the densest water water will ever be. Right? Because once it hits zero, what happens is it's like, okay, we're about ready to freeze. And then you do this, elbow room, personal space time, right? And so what happens is you expand. So when you do this, all the water molecules push off of each other and they kind of give themselves personal space. And it basically creates this kind of open sort of honeycomb structure of water. And at that point, the water will freeze. That's zero degrees. But notice you're less dense than when you were tightly packed together between zero and four degrees make sense so that's kind of crazy so now why we why do we care right so what do we care about it floating uh, because of this imagine that you have a lake this is your biological relevance and it's the middle of winter a cold winter what happens to the top surface of the water it freezes right now here's the thing if ice were like everything else and the solid was more dense than the liquid, what would happen to that solid layer? It would sink down to the bottom. And then what would happen to the next layer of water? It's still cold out there. It would freeze and then what would it do? Then it would sink. And then it would freeze and sink and freeze and sink until eventually you ran out of water. And what would you get? A freeze over you get a totally, completely solid frozen lake. That is not conducive to life. Because ice floats, we know that there is a teeming ecosystem underneath the ice shelf. But if it were to freeze solid like everything else, there would be no room for living organisms underneath that. So that habitat would be gone and it wouldn't be there, right? So. So basically be like, you know, a glacier throughout the entire ocean, all over the, all, all, all over the place. And so that's kind of what, what it would look like. So um, now let's go ahead and take a look at another property of water. And this is actually part of the property of the water. Why? Because water is basically how we define acids and bases, which are really important because you eat acids all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm drinking an acid. Um, and you clean up oftentimes with bases, right? So when you take a look at this, how is this an extension of the properties of water? Because water does this, this is what water does. So if you take a look at water and we rewrite it, instead of writing it as H2O, write what I call acidic form, which basically means that you've got a hydrogen hanging out on the front plus the rest of it OH, right? So HOH, kind of the way it looks like when it's structured. So what happens with water is that at a low level, it's going to dissociate. Dissociation basically means it falls apart into its constituent parts, which is the hydrogen ion plus the hydroxide ion. So this basically right here, this creates acidity. Matter of fact, the more of it you have, the more acidic you are. It also creates the properties of acidity. For instance, the sour taste of acids is created by hydrogen ion. The more of it you have, the more sour it is. Right, here's a good example. Vinegar, pretty sour, yes? But manageable, isn't it? If I asked you guys to drink a small cup of vinegar, you could probably do it. I mean, I want to, but you could do it. Now that's coming in maybe around a pH of four-ish, five-ish, something like that. Now let's take something that's a little worse. How about lemon juice or stomach acid? What if I had you drink the same cup of lemon juice? Would that be a little harsher? No sugar, you lemonade people. Nope, that's cheating. No water, I know how you make lemonade. A little bit of lemon juice, a whole lot of water, and even 
twice as much sugar, right? Just the pure, straight lemon juice liquor. Just peel the lemon and chomp into it like an apple. Is that pretty harsh? Yeah, you can feel it, can't you? You can feel the extra sour. With vinegar, you can drink and you're like, okay, that's vinegar. It's not pleasant, but there it is, right? With lemon, you almost reflexively do what as soon as you bite into that lemon? I can see it on your face. You're like, right? I mean, it's lemon face. So that's basically telling me it's like, oh, yeah, that's a lot stronger, isn't it? That's because of the acidity. The sour is stronger. The other one that we also um, is the burn, right? Acids burn. How's that vinegar going to feel going down? It's going to burn your throat, isn't it? Right? Um, how does your stomach acid feel coming up? That hurts, doesn't it? I mean, you vomit a couple of times and oh my gosh, you just feel like your esophagus is just melted completely. Like you have to go to reconstructive surgery just to get your esophagus put back together. I mean, it starts to feel like somebody put emery cloth down your throat and just kind of sanded the inside of your throat really good for a couple of hours, right? That's the burn of the acid of your stomach. So the more hydrogen ion you have, the stronger the acid, the more burn and sour you have. And this one is what defines the base. So the more of the hydroxide you have, the more of the base you have. So basically when you take a look at an acid, any acid is defined by anything that will basically liberate a hydrogen ion, which is one of the reasons why we tend to write acids with that hydrogen on the front. For instance, here's a couple of different types of acids. We have hydrochloric acid, which is stomach acid. We have H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid, oftentimes associated with acid, right? So we have nitric acid, which is HNO3 and so forth, phosphoric acid, which is H3PO4, and so forth and so on. But notice they all have a common format. Let's start with H. Those are the hydrogens that they liberate. That's pretty common. So here's a good example of hydrochloric acid. Dissociating into the hydrogen ion, which is what makes it acid, and of course the chloride ion, which is its other part. Right? So then when we take a look at acid and base, let's take a look at the bases, right? So essentially, when you take a look at base, you're going to be liberating essentially a hydroxide ion, <clears throat> or we can also define you as your ability to reduce or bring down the hydrogen ion. Okay, both of those are true. So we take a look at a strong base, sodium hydroxide, which is a very strong base. You will never see this in nature. You always see this in chemistry labs and bio labs. But typically what's gonna happen with the base is you're gonna, you're gonna dissociate into your constituent parts. So sodium ion, which is one, and then of course your hydroxide ion, this creates the base. Is that? Now, that's the way acids and bases uh, work. Now, how do we measure these guys? So the way we, the, we measure these, we have a scale. We create a scale called the pH scale. And so the scale is a measure of acidity. It actually measures acidity. Why? Because it's actually measuring. It's a measure of your hydrogen ion concentration. So whenever I put like brackets like that with something in it, that's to say the concentration of whatever I write inside, okay? So it's a measure of your hydrogen ion. The idea is the more of it you have, you're an acid. The less of it you have, you're a base, but you're not measuring typically your hydroxide ion, okay? Now our scale ranges from zero to 14, where seven is neutral. This basically means that your hydrogen ion concentration is the same as your hydroxide ion concentration like we saw with water. If you have a pH below seven, it's acidic. This is basically where your hydrogen ion concentration is greater than your hydroxide ion concentration. And then when you have above seven, this is a situation where your hydrogen ion concentration is less than your hydroxide ion concentration. So the one important thing to remember is that the pH scale is logarithmic. What does that mean? It's a base 10 scale, right? There are other logarithmic scales that we use, by the way. 
uh, the Richter scale. Anybody know that one? Of course I do. But being a Californian, you live with the Richter scale, right? That's what we measure earthquakes on, right? So this was a 4.5 earthquake, which is pretty much nothing, right? But because it's a logarithmic scale, what that means is the difference between four and five is not one unit, it's 10. So if you have a, an earthquake that was five compared to an earthquake that is eight, you're not talking about an earthquake that is three times more aggressive. You're talking about one that is a thousand times more aggressive because it's three, right? Five, six, seven, eight. So there's a distance of three there. Each one of those is worth 10. So you jump by tens, right? So an earthquake of six is 10 times stronger than a five. And a seven is a hundred times stronger than a five. And an eight is a thousand times stronger than a five, right? That's because it's base 10 math. The same thing is true for the pH scale, right? So when I said that vinegar comes around a four, it doesn't sound like it's that significant, does it? But lemon juice is two which means it's not two times more acidic, it's a hundred times more acidic than vinegar, which is the reason why it's harsher and why we taste that and feel that, okay? So that's important. So here's what it looks like. So here's our pH scale. So here you can see your ion concentration. So 10 to the zero, that basically equals one. So that's a very low concentration, excuse me, backwards, very high concentration of hydrogen ion versus 10 to the minus 14. The negative exponent basically means that that is one over 10 times 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 10, 14 times. That's a very tiny number. So this is a very low concentration of hydrogen ion. Now compared to the pH value, the reason why we use pH is because it helps us to understand pH in a little bit more of a user-friendly way. It's difficult to talk about acids as, you know, 2.5 times 10 to the minus six. That's your acidity. What? How many of you guys have ever balanced like cool chemicals or like spa chemicals or something like that? Hot tub chemicals, right? Those little test strips. Now, how would you like it instead of giving you a number if that was all said like, oh, this is a 2.10, you know, 2.5 times 10 to the six. What am I supposed to do with that? Right, that's kind of a little clumsy. So what we do is we use the pH scale to help it make to make it a little easier to use. So then when we take a look, then these are whole number integers. The low numbers are going to be acids. Seven is going to be neutral, and then the high numbers are going to be the bases. Now notice the pattern here that we see in this. So first of all, in the acids, we have pure hydrochloric acid. That's reagent grade stuff. We're going to get that in a lab. That's down to zero. Stomach acid, which is around two, so it's a pretty nasty place. That's the reason why it hurts coming out, is because it's an exceptionally strong acid. Lemon juice is down here, you lemon lovers, right? So that's also a pH of two. Um, uh, by the way, a lot of us, if you like really like sour foods, like some of you like lemons, but like the salt and vinegar chips, that one goes great. Um, but they have also some acid on there. That's what gives it that kind of vinegary taste of it. But if you've eaten too many of those, like I've done, right, in one sitting, what does it start doing to your mouth? It starts to hurt, doesn't it? Because you're all of a sudden you're like, ooh, I can't, you know, my mouth is starting to hurt. I can't eat this entire bag, even though I want to, right? That's because of the acid. The acid is starting to wear and tear on the inside of your mouth, and you're starting to feel it a little bit. You're starting to feel that burn. Vinegar is coming in around uh, three. I said four. Um, I was guessing, but I wasn't too bad, too, too far off. So um, soft drinks, right? Those are coming in, those are pretty acidic. So, um, and by the way, that's all soft drinks. So if you're one of those believers that uh, the way to quell an, an acidy stomach is to drink Sprites, think differently. Because Sprite is a soft drink, it's acidic. You're just gonna be adding an acid to an acid and compounding the problem. Okay. So just remember that. Beer, man's favorite acid trip, right? So we got a lot of beer joints across the, Across the street, probably after a good exam, you guys will probably go and uh, consume some of your favorite acids just to sort of um, expunge the memory of the exam from your mind. <laughs> um, tomatoes are pretty acidic. 
right? So as a food source, they're pretty acidic. And that's the reason why a lot of people complain about tomatoes and tomato-based um, sort of uh, foods and things like that, because it's like, I can't eat that because it's too acidic. It kind of hurts my mouth. A lot of people will uh, have that complaint. Coffee, my preferred acid trip. That's coming in around five. So notice it's uh, two times more benevolent to my system than it is beer, right? So beer is a lot worse, even though it doesn't feel like it um, at all uh, at times. Urine is another body fluid coming in. It's a little bit acidic. It's designed to be acidic. That's kind of what it does. It's supposed to be because that's one of the ways that you offload excess acidity in your body when you become too acidic in your body. One of the ways you get rid of that is by urinating out the acid. So that's the reason why your urine is acidic. Pure water is seven. Seawater, which is a little on the alkaline side. Baking soda is coming around nine. Great Salt Lake, right? We're close to the Great Salt Lake. It's just a state over. They don't call it the alkaline flats for no reason, right? There's a lot of alkaline salts that and that causes that to be alkaline in nature. Um, ammonia is coming in around 11. Bleach is around 12-ish, 13. Sodium hydroxide is around 14. This is also reagent grade. Um, or oven cleaner comes in around 14, right? Which is one of the reasons why when you guys use oven cleaner, it's important not to go crawling around inside your oven without like the windows open and good, uh, good cross breeze coming through the house because you're going to basically inhale a pretty nasty base and that's not a good idea right and then you can see on oven cleaner go take a look at oven cleaner can't they have warnings like all over them i mean they're like everywhere they're like um do not do this like because they know that's what people do they crawl inside their uh, unventilated oven spray the devil out of it and then they inhale all that oven cleaner and then here we go to poison control right so so that's basically your acids and bases. So notice a pattern, right? On the acidic side of things, we have all the things that we tend to eat and consume. And on the basic side of things, we have all the things we use to clean up after we eat. But that also basically tells us something. Our biology and all biology is acid leaning. So we basically tolerate acids much better than we do bases. Here's a good example of that. Like, if I ask you to drink a cup of vinegar, are we causing poison, calling poison control? No, right? Good with that. Because it's actually less acidity than what's in your stomach, right? So you're kind of neutralizing your stomach a little bit, right? Now, if I had you drink the same amount of ammonia, are we calling poison control? Boy, how do we are? Why? Because your body is not on the basis when we made a choice, all living systems, by the way, when we made a choice, which was which acids. But when we did that, we means we also chose which are the bases. When you pick sides, you don't just pick an ally, you also pick the enemy. Right? The one you don't pick becomes your enemy. And in this case, the bases. Right. And I'll take a look at buffers. Buffers are important. Um, because when we take a look at a buffer, a buffer is essentially an solution as in H when you ask sort of Thank you very much. Okay, buffers. So one thing it does not do is it doesn't maintain neutrality. That's the biggest mistake students make.
it just maintains the pH wherever in the scale it is, right? Because I can create an acidic buffer, which will maintain the pH at a pH of two. I can actually make a basic buffer, which will maintain the pH at say a pH of 10. But most of what we run into are the neutral buffers. Why? because these are what our bodies use. Our physiological pH, that is the pH of your um, blood, your tissues, the fluid tissues and your uh, tissues is basically around 7.4. And so the reason why we mostly see neutral buffers is because that's mostly what we see in living systems is a, neutral, a neutrally maintained um, pH, but basically what this means is a buffer will have essentially basic molecules in it. It's a combination of molecules. So it'll have basic molecules in it. So when I add an acid, the base will neutralize the acid that I added, keeping the pH the same. It also has acidic molecules in it. So when I add a base, it'll neutralize the base, keeping the pH the same, okay? Now, in our system, so these are important because it helps us to sort of maintain that sort of homeostatic norm for enzymes in particular that are doing a lot of our chemical reactions. But in our pH, what keeps our physiological pH at 7.4 is our what's called our carbonate buffer system. Our carbonate buffer system is, where am I, is coming up. Thought I had that slide in here. I used to have that slide in here. I think I took it up. Okay. So our carbonate buffer system basically is when you take CO2 and you add it to water, it's going to convert into carbonic acid. And actually, I want to write the carbonic acid, which is H2CO3. This is carbonic acid. And just like any other good acid, it dissociates into hydrogen ion, that's your acidity, plus bicarb. Of sodium bicarbonate, day, baking soda, right? So this is reversible so that you can manipulate how your pH is. If you need more acid, you push it forward to create your hydrogen ion. If you need to tone down the acid, you need to take some of the hydrogen ion out of circulation, then you can push this reaction in the opposite direction. Okay, so this is what this is what causes your physiological pH of seven point four. By the way, this same buffer system, the carbonate buffer system, is actually how you make the hydrochloric acid in your stomach. So this is an important buffer system that we have. So. Now let's go ahead and take a look at some of the macromolecules, the molecules of life, which are necessary things to understand before we can even approach the rest of the systems and things like that, which are coming, which is one of the reasons why I'm not rushing through too. I don't care about the schedule, but this is stuff that we need to make sure we have. But otherwise, the rest of it's not going to make any sense whatsoever. Right. So we're going to take a look at the molecules of life. And so ultimately, we have four major macromolecules, organic molecules that make us all up. That is to say we have carbohydrates, we have lipids, we have proteins, and we have nucleic acids. Those are the four. What that basically means is any living thing on the planet, including you, grass, trees, animals, whatever, if we were to break all those organisms up into the four main categories, all we would find are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. That's it. So these four macromolecule groups is what makes up the lump sum totality of our body and of every living organism's body as well. So the important thing is the way that you build these is by kind of putting them together uh, using subunits. So to put these guys together, what I like to think of is I like to use the brick wall analogy. A brick wall is made out of what? Not a trick question. 
It's made out of bricks, right? So bricks, the individual bricks are what we refer to as the monomer. Monomer means one thing, mono, one, mer, thing, right? So these are the individual little subunits. So when you put the bricks together and you stack them all up, then you make the wall itself, right? Which we refer to as the polymer. Polymer simply means many things. And not only that, but there is a process to doing this, isn't there? So first of all, you take your monomer, your brick, and you slather some mortar on it, right? And you stick it to another brick, and then you slather some more mortar on that, and you stick it to another brick and so forth. That's the process of putting one monomer together with another, building your polymeric structure, the brick wall, right? So there's a process to building these. So when you have your monomer, we want a process to build our polymer. That process is called dehydration. Now, imagine that you had a brick wall and you can do this. A lot of people don't do this, but you can. Imagine you wanted to tear that brick wall apart and recycle the bricks use them for something else, right? You can do that, right? You can cut through the mortar. They can do this, masons can do this, they do this all the time, right? You can cut the mortar off and you can sort of liberate those bricks, clean them all up. And then you can basically take your brick wall and you can break it down into the individual bricks, the monomers, right? Simple poly bricks. So you have the ability to go the reverse direction. The process of that is to cut through the mortar and liberate the monomer. That's the process. There's a process to that as well. In biology, to go from the polymer to the monomer, this is our hydrolysis reaction. So basically, you can build a structure, a macromolecule, the polymer, by putting together individual subunits with dehydration synthesis. Or you can tear that polymer apart into individual subunits by using the reverse reaction, hydrolysis. Hydro means water. Lysis means to cut. So this means using water to cut, water cutting. Okay. Whereas dehydration, dehydration, you're lo losing water. Um, that basically is the process of how you build your macromolecules. Think of the macromolecules as your brick wall. And each of the individual subunits are your bricks. Here's how it looks. And the top is dehydration. So imagine you have one subunit. This is one monomer. Here's your other monomer. And you want to link these guys together into a polymer. The first thing that you do, there's enzymes that are doing this, right? So this isn't magic. There's an enzyme that's doing this hard work. Is you're going to cut this bond right here and this bond right there. Now, hold on. Remember, these atoms are sharing these bonds in order to make themselves happy. As soon as you cut these bonds in these relationships between these atoms, you're making them unhappy. So once you do this, this guy is no longer happy. He's very sad, very upset. So is this guy. It's like, wait a minute. I had a perfect here for a second, and now you just basically screwed me all up, right? So what does the enzyme do? The enzyme says, listen, OH and hydrogen, you are the components of water. So why don't you two come together and form water and then leave? That's dehydration. So dehydration because you lose a water in the process. But guess what? Those monomers are still unhappy, aren't they? So now what the enzyme says is fine. Subunit number one, meet subunit number two and form a bond. Now these guys are happy. Just like water. So now what was one? is now a chain of two. You wanna add a third, you do the same thing. So over here is your OH, use the hydrogen of your other monomer, and you basically cut it here, form the bond there, water exits, and then what you was two is now three. And you can keep adding and adding and adding. So that's dehydration, that's how you build a polymer. Hydrolysis this is the opposite. So now what happens with hydrolysis is you take a polymer 
and you want to split it apart. So the way you do this is you use water to do this. So first of all, you cut this bond here and then you cut water and you basically say, listen, why don't you grab onto OH and you grab onto hydrogen and be happy, right? So you basically do the reverse reaction. Now this guy goes off, he's happy because he's got everything he needs, but now you got a single subunit and this can go off and do whatever you need it to do, okay? Now, here's a, a good example. I mean, it's like if you have a pile of bricks because you just cut up a brick wall, you can now use that brick to throw through your neighbor's window. All right, so that would be a different function for that brick, which you may have some neighbors that you might to throw a brick through the window. I've got more than a few. But that's basically the two sides of it, right? Those are the processes. One, to build molecules, dehydration. The other one, to tear them apart and to break them down. Okay, so that's... That's the, that's the funnel of you. That's where it all starts. So now that we understand the process of how to build these molecules, now let's take a look at the molecules and how they're built. Starting off, first of all, with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are basically an energetic molecule. So they're oftentimes, they're nutritional, mostly, but they can also be structural. structural. So we'll use these often as energy, for instance, a sugar high. But they can also be structural for structure. Typically, they all have this sort of two to one ratio. For instance, if you take a look at um, C6H12O6, that's a carbohydrate. Notice you have this one to two to one uh, ratio. So that's kind of a common sort of a thing that you see. Um, your ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is two to one. Typically, your carbon hydrogen oxygen ratio is one to two to one. And so that's true for most carbohydrates. Now let's take a look at the bricks, right? We're gonna be building a brick wall here, a carbohydrate brick wall, but let's start off by building the bricks because any good Mason will tell you that the success of building a brick wall is understand your materials first, right? Understand your bricks first, understand your process of how to put those bricks together, right? Because if you don't have the process of how to put those bricks together, then you have no hope of building a good brick wall. That's the reason why we start this off with talking about dehydration synthesis is because we need to understand the process to put these together, okay? So basically our monomers or our subunits are what's called monosaccharides. Mono means one, saccharide is associated and actually means sugar, so it's one sugar. So these are essentially single subunit sugars and they form the backbone of most uh, carbohydrates. And so these will come in a couple of varieties. Sometimes we'll have carbon um, monosaccharides with three carbons in them. Some will have seven, uh, some will have five and so forth. And so like, for instance, depending on how many carbons you have, you'll be referred to as um, um, like either a hexose or in this case, five is a pentose, hexose is six. Triose, tri uh, three is a three carbon sugar. And for instance, um, and, and so forth. So that's most of what we see. We, most of what we see is triose, pentose, and hexose. That's the majority of what we see actually in biology, okay? Now, notice another thing. For most carbohydrates, you have a common suffix, O-S-E, means that you're dealing with a carb. Think about it. What are the different types of sugars that you've dealt with? Well, there's house sugar, basic common table sugar, sucrose. We talked about glucose, there's glucose, right? How many are lactose intolerant? That's lactose, right? Um, or maltose, another sugar. I see that in malted beverages, okay? Um, so those, all those tend to, and even like some that you maybe I even know what they are, like dextrose, you'll see that in nutritional labels, right? So you have dextrose or, or um, or things of that note, sucralose is another one, right? So you don't necessarily know what it is, but you know it's a carbohydrate because of that OSC suffix. So that's a giveaway. Um, glucose is probably the pat, the poster boy for the monosaccharides. That's the one we typically find the most, we run into the most, and we think about the most. Why? Because this is basically your body's preferred energy source. And that's true also for all carbohydrates. Uh, right, because when your body is burning fuel, this is fuel. This is energetic fuel for your body. If you give your body 
a carbohydrate, you candy lovers, you are going to be giving your body its preferred fuel source. Now, that's a good thing, right? This is one of the reasons why, by the way, all those energy drinks have sugar in them. Well, except for the unsweetened ones, right? Or the, the, um, the zero sugar ones. But most of them have sugar in it. Yeah, your monsters, your rock stars, Gatorade, for instance, right? Why? Because sugar is a preferred fuel source for your body. So when football players are chugging Gatorade on the sideline, it, they're giving their body extra fuel so that they can finish the game, right? It's also the preferred source. So what does that mean? That means that if your intention is to try to do some fat burning, then the last thing you want to do is eat a bunch of carbohydrate because your body will never touch your fat reserves if you just drank a bunch of Gatorade. Right, your body's going to burn the Gatorade. It's not going to touch your fat reserves. So in order to do fat burning, you have to make sure that your body is fueled so that it has to switch to burning the fat reserves. Okay. Something that's very common that a lot of people don't realize. Like they'll have their favorite drink, right? Their energy drink or whatever while they're working out or while they're jogging. And that's fine. But if you think you're burning fat, you're not. You're giving your body the fuel that it wants to burn. You're giving it carbohydrates. It's never going to touch your fat reserves. Okay. And that's intentional. Because your body wants to hang on to fat. That's designed to do that. And if you've ever tried to lose weight, you know what a struggle it can be. It's clear that your body does not want to let go of your fat reserves. Right? It hangs on to it at all costs. And that's a good thing. Um, biologically speaking. Obviously. So this is kind of the way you uh, draw glucose. So here's our poster boy. So C6H12O6. And so you can see there's a lot of scary things here, but basically it's a cyclic structure with six carbons in it. One of those is outside of the ring itself. But when you form this ring, what happens is um, on each corner of the ring, you have either a hydrogen or a hydroxyl group. So this is kind of below the ring. This is below the ring, above the ring, and below the ring. And so you'll see this kind of arrangement all around. Typically we abbreviate it by just drawing a little hexagon, okay? So these are just different ways of writing glucose. So I don't want to get too bogged down into carbohydrate biochemistry. It's just not necessary for us. Okay. So that's our preferred monomer. That's your body's preferred source of fuel. So what if we want to join these two together, right? So join some uh, of these monosaccharides together to create the beginnings of a chain. Well, at first we create what's called the disaccharide. The reason why these are important is because these are often the main form of carbs circulating in the body. So you don't usually have just three glucose circulating the body. Oftentimes what's circulating your body is some sort of disaccharide. That's a pretty common circulatory form of carbohydrates. Okay. So how do you make it? Basically you start off with two uh, monosaccharides and you basically just put them together with a dehydration reaction. Simple as that. And so you take a look at here, we have two different glucoses. So we have all these OH groups around the glucose. That's going to be the contributors to water. And so you can see you have an OH group here and a hydrogen here of the other glucose. So what's going to happen is the enzyme is going to cut this bond here. It's going to cut this bond here. It's going to take these guys and send them off as water. So that's what's going to happen there. And then it's going to take this carbon and it's going to bind it to this oxygen. So this carbon will bind to this oxygen right there into what's called a glycosidic bond. <clears throat> and once you've done that, you've now joined two glucose molecules together and what you've created is maltose. So you've gone from two monosaccharides, join them together with dehydration reaction into a disaccharide plus water. Okay. Now then, different disaccharides will be different. For instance, um, sucrose, which is table sugar, is a glucose plus another monomer called a fructose. Lactose, for those of you lactose intolerance, is actually a combination of glucose 
and another hexose called galactose. So you can see, even though we deal mostly with glucose, there are other types of monosaccharides. If you link any of them together, you're going to create a disaccharide. And then if you keep adding to it, you're going to start creating what's called a polysaccharide. So the polysaccharides are complex carbohydrates, long, typically polymers of glucose, repeating glucose subunits over and over and over again. And there's a couple of different types of polysaccharides. There's what's called the nutritional polysaccharides. Um, that's going to be these guys right here. So this is going to be nutritional in nature. So starch, for instance, plant starch. So what plant starch is, is basically a storage strategy for the plants. So for instance, think uh, potatoes, right? So that starchy matrix inside of a potato is mostly starch. And that is basically there for the plant. The plant is actually building that starch reserve inside the potato for its own purpose. So when you look at the life cycle of a potato, you don't typically grow potatoes from like a seed. If you buy them at a nursery, they have like little starter potatoes and you plant those. And so that gives the plant the energy needed to start in the initial growth phase. And then throughout the season, what's happening is the potato plant is doing photosynthesis. It's making carbohydrates and it's taking those carbohydrates, those glucoses and bundling them into starch and storing that starch into these potatoes. Why? Because those potatoes will be the energy reserve for next year's plants. So if you just leave potatoes in the ground, then you're going to get a bunch of potato plants coming up the following year. Okay, so that's basically how that works. So this is the plant's food reserve. It's storage of food. We do the same thing, only in this case we make glycogen. So this is animal starch. For the same reason, we have a lot of glucose, and so we bundle it up in this sort of storage structure, glycogen, and we store that glycogen starch typically in two places. The first one is we're going to store that in liver. So we see glycogen granules in liver and in skeletal muscles. So that's basically where we store our glycogen. We don't have a separate structure like a potato to just dump a bunch of starch in, right? Potatoes have that. They can take a root and they can say, you know, I'm gonna sacrifice you and I'm just gonna turn you into a potato because they can just make other roots, right? We can't, it's not like we can just take our pinky and just start filling it full of starch because then we've got this big club on the end of our hand and it's like, um, I can need that pinky for gripping and things like that playing the piano. I can't really play the piano with this big old ball of starch on the end of my hand, right? So we don't really have that, that ability to do that. So these are nutritional. Cellulose, these are the structurals, right? So this is a structural type of polysaccharide. So cellulose is similar to starch, slightly different in construction, different type of glucose that's used, but this is the component of plant cell walls. And so we can't digest this because we simply don't have enzymes for it. So what happens when we eat plant cell walls? By the way, has anybody ever eaten a vegetable? Any spinach lovers? You guys are no, saying painful wins, <laughs> right? I feel like it nice and fresh. Yeah, good spinach salad. It's one of my favorites. Right. How about celery? Any celery lovers? It's a strong taste. A lot of people don't like celery. Especially that like little, those are strings. Those are great, right? You can floss your teeth afterwards. Do you know what those strings are? That's pure collagen. Collagen. Cellulose. I'm thinking AMP. I just finished AMP yesterday. So I'm like, still got AMP on the brain. Right, that's cellulose, that's pure cellulose. And so that's what cellulose looks like. So you still eat that, you can't digest it, but what happens is it passes through. And so that kind of is what we refer to nutritionally as, as fiber. It's a good thing, by the way. Doctors always tell you, you know, you need to eat more fiber. Why? Because fiber, because it's not digested, is kind of like almost like, um, uh, like a biological scouring pad. 
right? Because it doesn't digest and absorb, it goes through a solid material in your waste. But as it goes through your system, it's kind of like moving through the system and kind of helps sort of scour out your intestines and things like that and keep things from getting dislodged or lodged in there. Okay. So it's a good thing. So when you take a look then at the structure of how you build a carbohydrate, especially a polysaccharide, this is kind of what it looks like. So generally speaking, when you're linking together these glucose molecules in a long chain, that kind of forms this little corkscrew-like structure. So you can kind of see this, this little cylindrical kind of corkscrew structure, which is non-branched. This is typically your plant starch. We usually refer to this as amylose. And then what happens is you'll start to branch. So here you can see your main chain going through here. And you can see a side branch going through here and then through here. So you can see these branches coming off of it. When it becomes branched, um, we typically refer to this as amylopectin. So like fruit pectin is actually fruit starch. It's starch that's been branched. So you, the reason why you branch stuff is so you can store more. So you want to be able to store more carbs per unit space. So when it's branched, you can actually store more, more glucose than if it were just all single stranded. Okay. So that's what plant starch looks like. This is glycogen. So glycogen is a little bit different. And glycogen, it's like crazy. So um, glycogen is all over the place. There's lots of branching in glycogen. So when you take a look at this, you can kind of see this chain. You can see a branch coming off here and a branch coming off of the branch and a branch coming off of the branch. There's another branch and a branch over here another branch over here. All of a sudden, now you see it's like you can't even tell where the main chain is because there's so many branches all over the place. And so as a result, what happens is this glycogen starts to just form what's called like a little pod-like structure, which is a glycogen granule. And the reason why we do that is so that we can store a lot of, a lot of glucose in a small area by creating this. And so you can see these like in the liver cell, you can see these like little dark brown deposits. Those are glycogen granules. That's where you store your glycogen. It's your reserve. Okay. Now for the structural ones, this is cellulose. It's a little bit different, slightly different type of structure of glucose. So notice what happens here is in this particular case, when you are doing your chain, your bonds, I want to point this out. So notice here that this is what's called alpha glucose. It's basically simply um, just the nature of like this OH group is pointing down in alpha glucose. That's simply the difference in beta glucose, what's called beta glucose, which is this guy right here. This basically is pointing up. So what happens is in alpha glucose, where all of your bonds are pointing down. So you can see it's pointed downwards, downwards, downwards. That creates the, this kind of corkscrew chain. But when it's beta glucose, what happens is it alternates. It points up in one and then down, and then up and then down, and then up and then down. And what that does, it creates, instead of the corkscrew, creates a straight chain, which is able to stack tightly against each other and create these like little cellulose fibers, like little ropes of cellulose. And we don't have enzymes for this. That's the reason why we can't digest it. Okay. okay, so now your head is probably hurting. But let's move into lipids. So lipids are basically the nonpolar group. These guys do not dissolve in water. So these are the um, nonpolar hydrophobic molecules. So they don't have any polar groups on them, but they have a lot of different types of functions and a lot of different forms. So this is kind of where our brick wall kind of breaks down a little bit because um, a brick wall is pretty easy, right? So a wall, multi subunits made out of single subunits, the brick itself, okay? In this case, it's a little bit different because 
you have different types of lipids. For instance, you have what's called triglycerides, which is your fat molecule. So you have fats and oils. You have phospholipids, which is a different type of lipid. You have steroids and waxes. Those are all different types of lipids. So one thing they have in common is that they are all nonpolar. They are all hydrophobic. Let's take a look first of all at the nutritional ones. So fats and oils, these typically tend to be nutritional. So a triglyceride is basically so-called because it is essentially taking one glycerol, it's glycerol backbone, which is a free carbon carbohydrate. And to it, you're going to attach three fatty acids, which is where the tri comes from. Tri, three fatty acids, glyceride, glyceride on the glycerol backbone. And so you have these fatty acids that are attached to the glycerol backbone. So this is essentially your fat molecule. How much free fat is in your bloodstream? It increases the more lipids you eat. Okay. Now, when you take a look at fats, generally speaking, we refer to fats as those uh, of animal origin. So uh, what type of a fat would be from animal origin? Like if I would sent you guys to the supermarket, I say, come back with some sort of a fat, what would you come back with? You bakers, you probably have this in your pantry. Especially you cookie bakers. Huh? Real butter, yeah, definitely. Real butter is one of them. Mm -hmm. So what else would you come back with? Yeah, lard or shortening, right? So that's basically animal fat. So basically you have lard, butter, like bacon grease. Like back in the day when I was growing up, we had a dairy farm, a family that was a dairy dairy family. And they uh, visited them from old friends. Um, it, and I visited their farm and, and they would, uh, back in the day, they would cook everything in bacon grease, right? Because they would have bacon and they would cook it. And so uh, like back in the day, you didn't have like a grocery store like we have. You couldn't just go to the store and get oil, like cooking oil or something like that. So you used what you had, which was usually an animal fat like grease. And you had this like little coffee can full of like hardened bacon grease, right? Um, so everything tastes like bacon, which is great if you like bacon. Not so much if you don't, right? So your green beans taste like bacon. Your, pretty much everything you cook tastes like bacon, right? but it's, it's an animal fat. So these tend to be at room temperature. They tend to be solid, yes? So what that means then basically is they have a high melting point. Now, oils on the other hand, typically are plant origin. So what kind of an oil would you come back from the grocery store? Yeah, it's probably the most common one, right? Pretty much anything, right? Olive oil. Safflower, grapeseed. Notice they're all coming from plants, right? Those are oiled at room temperature. They're all liquid, right? So they have a basically a very low melting point. This is kind of what it looks like. So here's your glycerol backbone. So this is your triose. Right, so you can see your free carbons with these like little OH groups. So you can see that this is the donating H when you go through dehydration synthesis. The fatty acids themselves are literally just long chains of carbon linked together with a little acid head. So that's a, this acid head is actually an organic acid head. Notice you have an OH group that's gonna be the contributor to the water. And so what's gonna happen is these, you're gonna cut this bond here and this bond here. They're gonna leave as water and you're gonna link this carbon to this oxygen. So this carbon and oxygen, that's the bond you're gonna create right there. And uh, this, we call this the ester bond. I think you do that three times. So here's your three fatty acids. So this is your fat molecule, your triglyceride. Notice that the fatty acid chains do not have to all be the same. They can be three different types of fatty acid chains. Okay. So triglycerides are hydrophobic by nature because they're lipids, right? So they're nonpolar. So um, if they were in the body, 
which is mostly made out of water, what's going to happen to these triglycerides? Maybe some of you guys have taken a blood test. Have you seen what your blood looks like in the vial? What's floating on top? Yeah, it looks like a little fat layer, right? It's pretty depressing, actually. Um, but those are the lipids in your blood. So what would happen to them? They would basically coagulate together, just like oil and water, right? The oil automatically separates out from the water. So here's the problem. If these are such important molecules for our body, it's a problem then, isn't it? Because remember, hydrophobics do not like hydrophilics. Your blood is hydrophilic. It's mostly made out of water. So how do you keep the lipids that you desperately need from basically stratifying in your blood? That's a problem, isn't it? So to keep that from happening, that's the clumping piece. What you have are what's called emulsifiers. What's an emulsifier? So an emulsifier is a chemical that will basically disperse your fat. Now here's a good example. Has anybody ever made an oil and vinegar salad dressing at home? Have you ever done that? What does it look like? You got the hydrophilic layer, right? Vinegar and your spices, right? Sometimes you'll add water in there just to kind of tone down the vinegar taste to it so you can actually enjoy it, right? And then the, you have the oil part, right? So what does it look like? Distinct layers, doesn't it? Huh? Well, if you just add oil and vinegar and oil and water together, you're gonna have the vinegar piece and then you're gonna have the oil sitting on top. Right, they're not gonna to mix together. That's what your blood wants to do. Right, you can think of the oil as a vinegar layer as your blood, which is mostly water. That's the hydrophilic layer. The oil on top is what all those lipids in your system that you just ate want to do. Now, here's the thing. That's why you have to shake that up, right? You have to shake it up really good and then pour it. But here's the thing. When you go to the salad dressing aisle, I like to pick on Numatone, uh, mostly because I just like the idea of Numatone. And they're actually good salad dressing. Right? So if you go to Numatone, do you see that nasty little oil layer on top? It's not what you see anymore, is it? Right? Why? Because if you saw just a bunch of oil, would you likely buy that? No, because it looks gross, right? So is there oil in a Newman's own vinaigrette? Sure there is. But if you look closely, it's just like little droplets, right? You can see like little oil droplets all sort of dispersed throughout the salad dressing. You know what's causing that? Emulsifiers. So in order to break up the oil layer, what happens is Newman's own adds emulsifiers to the salad dressing. And what emulsifiers does basically is it takes the oil and it divides it up into little droplets. So basically an emulsifier will kind of have a hydrophobic piece to it and a hydrophilic piece to it. And it'll surround and inject the hydrophobic piece into the oil droplet and the hydrophilic piece would be sticking out. So what happens now is you can dissolve this into water for a watery type or a vinegary type background. So now what you have is a smaller little oil droplet. So you don't have this big old kind of depressing looking oil layer on top. And so that's what an emulsifier does. That's what your body does. So it basically emulsifies the oils that you eat. And then basically this allows enzymes to get to them easier so they can break those fats down. Another type of lipid are waxes. So we don't see waxes a whole lot, but typically a wax is essentially a fatty acid that's attached to an alcohol group. An alcohol is essentially an OH group. And so good thing about waxes is they prevent typically loss of moisture from body surfaces. For instance, the main wax that we see is cerumen, which is earwax. And so that kind of coats the inside of your ear to protect your ear from um, evaporation because your eardrum 
and your inner ear is a moist, humid environment. So your head would basically dry out if you didn't have that nice coating of wax in there to keep those uh, tissues, those vulnerable tissues from drying out. You also see waxes on plants as well. Um, it's not uncommon to see like desert plants have a very sort of a waxy skin associated with them. Um, aloe plants are like this, right? So those succulents are like this. Um, so they'll have that waxy cuticle to keep the water from escaping from them. Now, now when you take a look at fatty acids, that's another different type of um, lipid. So when you take a look at types of fatty acids, they're not all the same. Fatty acids can be either, um, either come in long chains, they can come in short chains or mid-sized chains. They all end in COH. That's that acid head. So that is that C double bonded to oxygen OH. That's basically what they all end in. And they can either be what's called saturated or unsaturated. So when you take a look at saturated or unsaturated, saturated fats are simply those that don't have any double bonds. That is to say they are all singly bonded carbons. That's a saturated fat. Unsaturated fats typically have double bonds in them. So what these tend to be is like, they can either have one or two double bonds like that. So those would be unsaturated. So they don't have the maximum number of hydrogens that you can put around there. So here's an example of an unsaturated fat, which typically tends to be oils. Saturated fats, which typically tend to be the fats, so the animal stuff. And then you have what's called trans fats. Anybody ever heard, heard of trans fats? Right? Trans fats are horrible. They're very terrible. Cardiovascularly, they're like eating rat poison. So you do not want to eat trans fats. These are the hydrogenated oils. So whenever you see the term hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated and then fill in the oil type, that's a trans fat. What a trans fat basically is, is when you have a carbon double bond, you only have, you know, here's, your, here's your chain. Your chain can either come in the same side or the opposite side. So what I want to do is I want to do what we normally have. So for instance, if you have your carbon chain coming in one side and then going out the um, same side, that's what we refer to in organic chemistry as the cis or same conformation. We know what to do with that. This is a good one. We know what to do with that. In a trans fat, however, this carbon chain will come in one side and then it'll exit the other side. This is the trans. We do not know what to do with this. This is actually a preservative. It's an artificial preservative that doesn't really exist in nature a whole lot. The only reason why we started making it was to make sure that we can eat Twinkies 3,000 years from now um, in the museum. And you know that's true. But you've probably all seen videos of the never dying Twinkie that's sitting in the back of somebody's car. And it still looks like they just bought it today, right? A lot of that is because of the trans fats. It's a preservative. And so those are very, very bad because when you take a look at um, trans fats, trans fats basically are the leading contributor to hardening of the arteries, arthrosclerosis, which is clogging up of your blood vessels, which can basically create heart disease. And so trans fats has the effect of basically increasing heart disease, which is the reason why we're cutting trans fats out of society and out of usage. You're no longer able to use trans fats in industry. I think that was a law that went into effect in 2021. So our dietary fat, what we're eating, is largely composed of our fats and oils and trans fats. Generally speaking, in the past, so for our dietary fat, for a 2,000 calorie diet, it was 65 grams. And so we used to think that it was the quantity of fat that caused the problem. But now what happens is it's not the quantity of fat, but it's the type of fat, right? How many of you guys take flax oil or fish oil, or you know somebody who does? Uh, 
Okay, right. So this is these are actually flax oil and fish oil are different types of fatty acids. The so-called good fats. Good fast, good fats. Right. So it's the type that you're that is important. So trans fats are bad, right? Um, fish oil and flax are good oils that your body can utilize. Also, typically, saturated fats are worse than unsaturated. This is the reason why it's a healthier option to cook with olive oil than it is to cook with lard or butter is because typically saturated fats have more fatty acids per unit than do sat unsaturated fats. So you're consuming, so if I take a potato chip boiled in these two fats, I'm consuming more fatty acids in my potato chip because they tend to be straight tailed and they pack together very, very tightly. So it's gonna be very, very dense. Think of a donut. If you ever have that kind of greasy sort of residue on your, on your mouth, that's probably saturated fats. Whereas unsaturated, if I boil it together, typically have kinks in their tails because of those double bonds. And so I have fewer fatty acids that I'm consuming. And as a result, they tend to be less aggressive in heart disease. So they're called good fats. So what I wanna do then is I wanna stop here and start here because this is a good break, a topical shift to the next phospholipid or the next lipid, which is the phospholipid. And so we will pick this one up next time. By the way, just to remind you next time, is not next Monday. That's Labor Day. Don't show up. It'll be the Wednesday after that. It'll be one week. Am I good?